information on the youth huddle experience, you can call us at 877-626-4651 or email nanyouthhuddle at gmail.com. And of course, that's all spelled out, nanyouthhuddle at gmail.com. Also, brothers and sisters, today is Saturday. Tomorrow is Sunday. Today at 5 p.m. Tomorrow, Sunday, 5 p.m., you want to make sure that you're tuning in to MSNBC's Politics Nation with Al Sharpton. That's today, Saturday, 5 p.m. Tomorrow, Sunday, 5 p.m., you want to tune in to MSNBC's Politics Nation with Al Sharpton. And right now, brothers and sisters, again, you want to call somebody. You want to tell them the Reverend Dr. Al Sharpton is in the house and getting ready to come to you. But right now, Dr. Alvin Ponder will be here to give you some additional information. Let's give him a welcome. Thank you, Attorney Hardy. Good morning, brothers and sisters, listeners and viewers, and thank you for tuning in to another Saturday Action Rally with the National Action Network. Here's some information to keep you in the know. Standing by Dr. Claudine Gay and protecting DEI. Listen, the National Action Network continues our weekly demonstration in front of the offices of hedge fund billionaire Bill Ackman, who is behind the campaign to oust former Harvard President Claudine Gay, and has relentlessly attacked diversity, equity, and inclusion programs across the nation. Nan led chants in front of Ackman's Manhattan office on Thursday, passionately shouting, when DEI is under attack, what do we do? Stand up, fight back. Nan will hold these demonstrations in front of Ackman's office every week to raise awareness about the need to protect DEI and continue pushing higher education on a path towards progress. I want you to join us now on Thursday at 787 11th Avenue. That's 11th Avenue and West 55th Street at 12 noon. See you then. Spend King Day with Nan. On Monday, January 15th, Reverend Sharpton and the National Action Network will hold several events honoring Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in multiple cities. It all begins in Washington, D.C. with their annual King Day Awards breakfast at the Mayflower Hotel beginning at 8.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. This year's honorees include MLK Day Labor Leader of the Year Award to CWA President Claude Cummings Jr. MLK Day Visionary Award to Maryland Governor Brother Wes Moore, Ta Taraji P. Henson, and Tracy Jenkins, who's the Executive Director of the Boris Lawrence Henson Foundation. MLK Day Youth Award to Dayana Burton, a youth leader. MLK Day Lifetime Service of Excellence in the Arts Award. Two award-winning actress Felicia Rashad. She's also dean of Howard University's Chadwick, a Bozeman College of Fine Arts. And MLK Day Education Award to Becky Pringle, who's the president of the NEA. Reverend Sharpton will then travel to New York City for NAN's annual King Day Policy Forum, right here at the House of Justice, headquarters in Harlem. Each year, New York City state and federal elected officials join NAN for this coveted event to commemorate Dr. King's work and renew their collective commitment to achieve his dream. This event set is set to begin at 1.30 p.m. <laughs> you better get here early. And a full list of attendees will be announced soon. And lastly, Reverend Sharpton will be the guest speaker at the King Day celebration at Jersey City, New Jersey, organized by NAN's Northeast Regional Director, Pastor Steffi Bartley. This gathering begins at 6 p.m. 
Eastern Standard Time and will feature prominent New Jersey leaders including First Lady Tammy Murphy, former Governor Jim McGreevy, and others. For the latest information about all three of these events that we just discussed, please visit our website at www.nationalactionnetwork.net. Well, welcome to all of you who have tuned in and joined us also via live stream at www.nationalactionnetwork.net and also live on Facebook at The National Action Network. If this is your first time joining us and or if you're not a member of NAN, we welcome you to NAN and invite you to join us and get into the action today. For more information and to join, you may visit www.nationalactionnetwork.net or just call 877-626-4651. Again, that number is 877-626-4651. Or just text the word NAN, N-A-N, to 59769. Welcome. All right. Thank you, Dr. Ponda. Right now, our dear sister, Nancy Darlene Crawford, she wants to know what's on your mind. Good morning, Nancy. To network by sharing your thoughts and viewpoints 24 hours a day by emailing what's on your mind at nationalactionnetwork.net or by calling us at 877-626-4651. This week we are going to start with our mother Ivory telling us what's on her mind. Greetings my nan children. Seeing that me and Mother um, Nixon are the oldest two that left, and as I tell you guys, you guys have to be my ears, my eyes, and everything, because this year is going to be my 90th year, come September. Oh, um, and Mother has a heavy heart today. We found my daughter and my son-in-law found my brother dead Wednesday morning in his house. He was getting dressed, all dressed to go to the doctor. And he just sit down and he died. So you guys hold me up, keep me in your prayer. We don't sorrow as others sorrow as the scripture said, who has no hope. We know that the scripture says to be absent from this body. He's up there. Amen. Thank you, Mother Ivory. God bless you. And our condolences to you and your family. Good morning. Tell us your name, where you're from, and briefly share what's on your mind. Good morning, Nan family. Happy New Year's to you. And uh, welcome back, Attorney Hardy, to where the action is. Happy birthday to Reverend Daughtry and to Katrina. We will surely miss you. This is going to be a three-part one for the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. We're going to just do the Father today. Stop spreading the news, the lies. Jesus is coming back. Matthew 19, 28, 28, 19, 20. Go ye therefore into all the world. I would like to be in my bed today because I do have a back issue. But I know I got to do what I got to do. So to bring it on home before I go into this, we need to know that love is more powerful than hate. Yeah. Because if it wasn't, none of us would be here. I'd like to give my sympathies to the senior citizen because if it wasn't for a generation, I wouldn't be here today. So I'm praying for you and your family. But it's about the children. Children are the heritage of the Lord. Every one of us were children. We are here now grown in our senior years, and we ain't that cute. Okay, so if you ain't got no love, you got zero. And we'll do that with part two, which will be the Holy Ghost. All right. Thank you, my sister. Good morning. Tell us where you're from, your name, where you're from, and what's on your mind. My name is Kazembe. Good morning to everybody. I'm from Bedstar, Brooklyn. I just want to thank the Nan family and uh, the leadership for the consistency and focus over these many years. I come before you today just to urge us to stand with South Africa 
as they pursue an independent foreign policy, in particular as they take Israel out to court. It's very important. You know, Israel gets the most foreign aid for the last 50 years, each and every year, but yet the United States government cannot tell them what to do. They do as they please. Africa must be able to have an independent foreign policy. With the black power that we have, blacks leading the major cities, the vice president, the head of the feds, can we pursue a pan-African black unity policy globally led by black people here in this country? So I just want to urge us to stand with South Africa as they're going to come under a lot of criticism from the United States government. Finally, I'd like to say happy birthday to Reverend Daughtry today. I'd also like to say yesterday was Dr. Khalid Muhammad's birthday. A happy birthday to him who has passed. Yesterday was also Leola Maddox's birthday, the, wa the wife of the late great Alton Maddox. Monday is Dr. King's birthday that we celebrate. And tomorrow is my birthday. And Happy birthday, my brother. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you. Good morning. Tell us your name, where you're from, and briefly share what's on your mind. Good morning. My name is Dr. Jesse Fields. I'm a medical doctor here in the Harlem community and an advocate. And I just want to say happy birthday to Reverend Daughtry. And so wonderful to, to see Attorney Michael Hardy and to be here with the National Action Network. What's on my mind, this being the weekend of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s the holiday, celebrating his, his actual birthday, January Monday, January 19th. What's on my mind is some of the words and work of Dr. King, such as the fierce urgency of now, and the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. Thinking about the now locally in Harlem and our communities in New York City, where one of the issues is privatization of public housing, it is happening, it is a risk to our people, and housing segregation and gentrification happening now, we have to address the long-term vision. We need to help bend the, the, the arc of the moral universe toward justice. And on this Thursday, I'm participating in a community resource fair and workshop on Rad Pack and privatization of public housing at PS 108 on 108th and Madison from 6 to 8. I have flyers which I will leave, on the, I put some on the literature table in the back. We're helping to bend the arc of the moral universe toward justice as we address the urgent issues of our time. No justice, no peace. All right, thank you so much. And be sure to check the literature on the table in the back. Good morning, tell us your name, where you're from, and what's on your mind. Good day, everybody, and God bless everybody. My name is Sister Reverend Word. I'm from heaven, born in Harlem. I'm 72 years old and new, and I'm a National Action Network Lifetime member. Of course, what's on my mind is Bible scriptures. In particular, Christ Jesus clearly showed that God are, and some of them are Republican politicians. Some of them are people who want to cancel DEI. Some of them are people who already canceled affirmative action. We are blessed with the opportunity to support people who at least are attempting to show us the love we need and to give us the service we need. So I really respectfully urge anyone, pay attention. Acknowledge the haters and acknowledge that they hate, but also acknowledge, more importantly, the, the politicians who really would like to be able to enforce laws that are designed to help us live a better life on this earth. So please vote for the right people and you know who they are. And I'm gonna personally say Biden and Harris. God bless y'all and good day. Thank you, my sister. Good morning. Tell us your name, where you're from and briefly share what's on your mind. Good morning, I'm from the Bronx. My name is um, Minister Sandra Henson Simpson. I was looking at the paper today. Um, we need to get a newspaper that says um, House of Justice or National Action Network. But I thank God for flying. I went to go visit family. I wasn't here for two of the, um, the rallies, but I pray for Rev. Um, Dr. Reverend Al Sharpton to stay strong and he's a good leader. I don't care what nobody said. Thank God for Michael, 
being back in the House of Justice. God bless you. Thank you, my sister. Good morning. Tell us your name, where you're from, and briefly share what's on your mind. My name is Merciful Allah. I'm a lifelong resident of Harlem. What's on my mind is the school education starting from pre-K, kindergarten, first grade, second grade, third grade, for our children, you understand, to gain the second language, being that we have an influx of people coming in from all countries, especially, you understand, the Spanish-speaking community, because in the future, you understand, there's going to be limited amount of jobs. There's a setback on the education for the advancement. And I've spoken to Chancellor Banks concerning it, right, that why you cannot truly have a bilingual classes with not only Spanish-speaking uh, students learning English, but English, particularly black children, you understand, learning Spanish. So I urge, you understand, the family of black people, particularly black women, you understand, that if you can't stand for your children at this stage, then the future, you understand, will look dim. Because, you understand, there's no question that if you speak two languages, you're going to get the shot before the person that only speak one language. So all these political leaders that's in the position, especially Yusuf Salam, that's now in the councilman, right, should be urging Chancellor Banks to have some kind of class intervention so that black children, you understand, can be bilingual and have an equal opportunity of all, all the opportunities that's now being presented. Thank you, my brother, and thank you to all that contributed today. That concludes this weekend's conversation of what's on your mind. Please keep in mind, everything you've heard today were simply the thoughts and viewpoints of the contributors and do not reflect those of National Action Network directly. And remember, you can interact with us 24 hours a day by emailing what's on your mind at nationalactionnetwork.net or by calling 877-626-4651. Back to you, Attorney Hardy. All right, Sister Crawford, thank you for another selection of this week's What's On Your Mind. Right now, brothers and sisters, we are pleased to have our Nan Change Choir soloist, Tisha Hunter. Good morning, everybody. To be a way maker. Listen, way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Oh, way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here, turning lives around. I worship you. Anybody? I worship you. You are here. In every heart, I worship you, my God. I worship you. Come on, help me say it. Waymaker, hey. He is a father keeper, not in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. If you can lift your hands and say, A way made yeah. a promise, a light in the darkness.
somebody lift your hands and say, That is safe. That is who you are. Here, Lord, yeah, that is. Tisha Hunter, our Nan Change Choir soloist, all under the direction of our musical director, Minister Tyrone Richardson. Right now, brothers and sisters, we are so pleased to have with us today for our inspirational words segment, the Bishop Sean Mason II. He's a senior pastor of the Freedom Church in the great borough of Brooklyn. Let's give him a National Action Network welcome. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. And I want to thank the Lord for being here today. I want to say Happy New Year to you all. Amen. And we want to give God praise for the Reverend Al Sharpton, Attorney Harding, and to all of you, my father's children, and especially to one of our fathers, the Reverend Dr. Herbert Daughtry. Amen. We celebrate the Lord for this legend being in our midst. Uh, very quickly to the word, Joshua chapter 14, beginning at the sixth verse. And the children of Judah came unto Joshua in Gilgal, and Caleb, the son of Jephthah, the Kenizzite, said unto him, Thou knowest the thing that the Lord said unto Moses, the man of God, concerning me, and thee in Kadesh Barnea. Forty years old was I when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to espy out the land, and I brought word again as it was in my heart. Nevertheless, my brethren that went up with me made the heart of the people melt, but I wholly followed the Lord my God. And Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land whereon thy feet have trodden shall be thine inheritance and thy children's forever, because thou hast wholly followed the Lord my God. And now, behold, the Lord has kept me alive as he has these forty and five years even since the Lord spake the word unto Moses while the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness. And now, lo, I am this day fourscore and five years old. As yet I am as strong this day as I was in the day that Moses sent me. As my strength was then, even so is my strength now for war both to go out and to come in. Verse 12, now therefore give me this mountain, whereof the Lord spake in that day that has heard that the Anakims were there, and that the cities were great and fenced in. If so, the Lord will be with me, that I shall be able to drive them out, as the Lord said. Once again, the top of verse 12, now therefore give me this mountain. So far, the scripture, I want to speak to you briefly from the subject, I want what's mine. I want what's mine. Uh, we are in the beginning of this year, and for many of us, uh, uh, it is an interesting time of year because we are making declarations. We are making proclamations, and we're saying what we're going to do, but there must be corresponding action to positive proclamation. Can I say that again? There must be corresponding action to positive proclamation. It's not enough just to talk a good game, but you got to be about it. Look at somebody say, be about it. Come on, say it again, be about it. And Moses and Joshua people were people who were about what they were talking about. But it doesn't start with them. It starts from a foundation. The children of Israel are in a place called Egypt. They are in slavery in Egypt. Why? Because the people were intimidated by their potential. Can I tell you, brothers and sisters, there are some people who are afraid of you even though you have not maximized your potential yet. I don't have the house yet. I don't have the degree yet. I didn't write the book yet. I need some holler yet. But my time is coming. And so they were afraid of them because they started to grow. And the Bible says the more they afflicted them, the more they grew. I need somebody to holler, I'm growing under pressure. 
Oh, come on, talk to me like a Sunday morning and say, I'm growing under pressure. Some of you, you had no idea how strong you were until you were by yourself. You had no idea how industrious you were until the pandemic happened. You didn't know how creative you were until your hands were all you had to use. But we grew under pressure. Mm -hmm. And so the Bible says that they get out of Egypt after a long fight. The Bible says they get out of Egypt, but brothers and sisters, they leave Egypt, but Egypt doesn't leave them. They leave slavery, but the slavery mindset does not leave them because it is a process to freedom. Can I say that again? It is a process to freedom. Something we have to learn how to do. So you need a Reverend Sharpton. And you need a Reverend Herb Daughtry to teach us how to become free. Because the Bible says, he that the sun sets free. I don't got to talk back church to me. Come on. He that the sun sets free is free indeed. The Bible goes on to say that they journey through the wilderness and they get to the promised land. But the promised land is not the finish line. Can I say that again? The promised land is not the finish line. When they get to the promised land, they've got to fight through the land. Brothers and sisters, we've got to fight through the land. I know Emancipation Proclamation, but we've got to fight through the land. Joshua 1 and 2, God tells Joshua, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now go. You cannot stay stuck in the past because there is a future you got to look forward to. I need somebody, I've got a future to look forward to. He deals with the reality of a new reality. Moses is dead, but it's up to Joshua. Moses is gone but it's up to Joshua the Red Sea was for Moses but this Jordan is for Joshua don't get so caught up in the Red Sea that you forget about your personal Jordan that you got to cross moving along the Bible says that Caleb goes to spy out the land uh, with Joshua and everybody else sees a problem they said there are giants in the land and we were as grasshoppers not in their sight but in our sight and brothers and sisters we are fighting with a poor self image you got to see yourself the way God sees you you got to see yourself blessed you got to see yourself healed you got to see yourself free Caleb says we are well able to take the land Moses in the place of God makes Caleb a promise because he wholly followed the Lord his God. That word holy is a hunting term which means to close the gap. You cannot afford to leave spaces between us and legislation. We cannot afford to leave spaces between us and our children. Look at someone say close the gap. He said you will have what belongs to you because you closed the gap. 45 years later, Moses is gone. Joshua's in charge. Caleb says, Joshua, Moses made me a promise. He said, this land belongs to me, and I want what belongs to me. We have these truths that are self-evident. That men are all created equal. Equal in theory, but not in reality. We must close the gap. And I want this year what belongs to me no justice no peace all right we want to thank bishop sean mason the second senior pastor of freedom church in brooklyn for those words right now the change ensemble
Change Choir, all under the direction of Minister Tyrone Richardson, and of course accompanied by the Nan Band Ensemble. Brothers and sisters, get on your feet, because I'm bringing you right now the president and founder of the National Action Network, the Reverend Dr. Al Sharpton. No justice, no justice, what do we want, what do we want, what do we want, when do we want it, 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 fist bump the person next to you, tell them you love them. January 15th, there was a march outside of the White House calling on then President Ronald Reagan to make a federal holiday out of Martin Luther King's birthday. Stevie Wonder and Mrs. King and others led the march. James Brown had arranged to talk with the president, took me in with him to lobby Reagan and Bush on the holiday. Reagan was polite but wouldn't move. He had called Dr. King a communist, said Dr. King was unacceptable. But on Monday, the whole federal and state government will be closed. And the Reagan library will be closed. Because if you just keep on fighting, your change will come. Your change, your change will come. Will come. Your change, your change is going to come. Just keep on fighting. Your change, your change I know will come. Will come. Your change, your change is going to come. Change will, change will come. Change will come. Change will come. Change will come. Change does not come from those that feel they're entitled to it. 
Change does not come from you that get in your silo and believe you're right and everybody else is wrong. Change doesn't come from you that are holier than thou, that don't work with the people that you're supposed to serve. Change comes from servants. Change comes from those that work. Change comes from change makers. If you stand up and fight back, your change will come. Your change, your change will come. Your change, change. change. change is gonna come. National Action Network Change Choir. Give them a big hand. Give them a big hand. Certainly we're happy to be with you another Saturday morning for the Saturday Action Rally. For you that are here live at the House of Justice, 106 West 145th Street in the village of Harlem. And for you that are listening live on 1190 WLIB AM in New York, and you that are watching on various media platforms, we're happy to be with you another Saturday to give our report on where the action is. Give a hand our presider, Attorney Michael Harding. <laughs> our musical director, Minister Tyrone Richardson. Certainly, Chris and the band give them a hand. Today, we, uh, I will give announcements a little later, but today I came out early because here at the House of Justice, this is Bishop Herbert Daughtry Day. Come on. Today, Bishop Herbert Daughtry is turned 93 years old. And we wanted him to know that we appreciate that most of those years he spent away from his family or either brought them with him and away from safety, lived in the eye of the storm for seven decades or more, fighting for us. And I know his church and churches, because he presides over the house of the Lord's churches around the country, but I know his national church would do something for him but I wanted us to dedicate today at National Action Network to his work and his life. It is said that you judge a tree by the fruit it bears, not by the bark it wears. And we are part of the fruit of the ministry of Bishop Herbert Daughtry. When I joined the Civil Rights Movement in the North, because I came from Brooklyn, I didn't come from down south. And when my mother brought me to Bishop Washington, saying she was concerned, I keep watching all this stuff on TV and wanting to be involved, and he brought me to Reverend Bill Jones and Jesse Jackson. And at 13 years old, they made me youth director of the New York chapter of Operation Breadbasket that Dr. King had started. It was the year Dr. King was killed. The vice chairman of that chapter was Bishop Herbert Daughtry. Bill Jones and Daughtry led the chapter that I started in civil rights. In fact, in those days, it was not common for Pentecostal preachers and Baptist preachers to work together. 
Uh, but Bishop Mason, Bishop Daughtry had the kind of ministry that the Baptist preachers and he could coalesce and bring us together. I, I, I often talk about the first time I saw a minister wear African garment was Bishop Daughtry. And he, he would not, when many times the tension, you know, we, we talk about it too briefly, but there always been tensions in movements. You had the nationalists and the integrationists and the this and the that. And Bishop Daughtry was one of the few that could bring all of the elements together and say that I know we don't agree on everything, but we agree on these objectives. And as I started breaking out and doing things, he would have to explain to them uh, situations that they did not uh, understand and know. So I want you to, uh, before we do anything, uh, for y'all to, somebody got something on, okay, thank you, uh, that I want us to hear some words from this pioneer from our struggle uh, and from this uh, who I believe helped mentor me and in mentoring that helped to start National Action Network as part of the outgrowth. Even Attorney Hardy uh, uh, used to go to Timbuktu sometimes <laughs> on the house of the Lord. And uh, uh, they used to have uh, uh, sessions of black history and struggle. And, Dart and uh, Hardy used to go there. So he's invested in all of us. Uh, as, uh, uh, as he reaches 93, he can look at me in my late 60s, he can look at Hardy in his early 80s and say he invested something. Hardy knew it was coming. He was laughing in advance. He knew it was coming. So I wanted this time for you to stand on your feet and salute on his 93rd birthday, Bishop Herbert Daughtry. Thank you. Thank you. No justice. No justice. No justice. No God bless you. Thank you very much. What did you say? Thank you. 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 <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sort of emotional. I'm kind of overwhelmed being here. I um, can't think of uh, too many other places. I'd rather be on the morning of my 91st birthday uh, than here at the National Action Network. And I can't think of too many other persons I'd, I'd rather be with um, than the Reverend Al Sharpton. I love coming here for various reasons. As you know, whenever I'm in town, I have a moment and my wife releases me. We usually have a date on Saturday. Uh, I come here and I sit and I look around and being with Reverend Sharpton take me down the corridors of history. As he mentioned, I remember when he was just a little fellow but always audacious, always many years beyond his actual age, always creative, always raring to enjoy the issues. And I watched him grow up, and I don't know that there are too many people with an amazing background and accomplishment as the Reverend Al Sharpton. Now, there are two other persons I always think about. Uh, one is the mayor of the city, Eric Adams, who come out of our movement. And the other is Charles Barrett, who also come out of our movement. 
And I think of these three, and I've written about them, by the way, because they have made such tremendous impact and have such tremendous influence. Maybe one more than the other, I'll leave that to you all uh, to discuss, but not even because they agree on all issues. We don't, we never did. There were times when I thought I would take <laughs> Bill Jones, who as he mentioned was the, was the chair, he used to say, Herb, you know, had a big head of a Herb, what are we going to do with Herb Sharpton? <laughs> I thought I would uh, take him in the woodshed and, and bang his head. And, but we always were together. We always were together. And it's because of what they, what they went through. As, thank you very much for the inspirational message. Bishop Mason, thank you very much. And you mentioned something about growing under pressure. What they have demonstrated is their, what they have achieved was not handed to them on a silver platter. No, no one went ahead to provide the space and get the rocks out of the roads and all of that. But they grew under pressure. And so thank you, thank you. We owe you an eternal debt of gratitude. We love you like a son. And may God continue to bless you and the family. Um, I don't know where to start. Maybe a good place to start is, you know, uh, when I was a young man, about 22 years old, and having tested the bitter grapes of the world, uh, and uh, uh, came to the end of myself, and I, I said, Lord, listen, here is my life. I put my life in your hands. This was 1953. I'm doing the right things. I don't even know if you're up there. Maybe I'm manipulating and cheating and whatever. But as well as I know myself, I want to make a commitment to you today. I want you to take my life and make me what you want me to be. Yeah, yeah that was 1953. Well, you know, I did these periodic involuntary vacations and uh, as I concluded this one, 1957, the Lord set me down and told me to write what I would be doing, what I was called to do. And I did. And it's here. 19 Lewis, Lew, Lewisburg vacation, Pennsylvania, 1957. And it's 10 pages, an outline of what God was calling me to do. And looking back now, over and near all of these years, um, thank God I've not deviated. And what it was is convert the world for Jesus Christ. Of course, we put a political spin on it of late. Save the planet. Save the people. And so, what, what I want to leave with you, and maybe as you grow older, you reflect more, is live for legacy. That is to say, we all going to leave here. The question is, how do you want to leave? How do you want to be remembered? I used to be, my Lord, here's my wife. I didn't see her. Stand. <laughs> now, you, you notice how she took my breath away. <laughs> uh, 
Somebody please. What, what was I talking about? <laughs> what was that? Let me see now. <laughs> legacy, yeah, legacy. Legacy. <laughs> legacy. legacy. Yeah, we're going to leave behind a legacy. And, and, and I used to be asked years ago, well, Reverend, how do you want to be remembered? I didn't like that question so much then. But I've learned to adjust to it and to understand it. Because we are living for the day, but we live for the future. Yeah. We live for the next generation. What we do now, the decisions that we make now, shape the future. And therefore, number one, I look at my family, I say, well, what do I leave on the record? Well, thank God for 61 years, but I'm glad my wife is here. And she's as brilliant and as beautiful as I first fetched her from her father's house. Uh, and be, and we, we had four children. My baby daughter, our baby daughter, is a retired principal now, probably the youngest one in the city, Dr. Dawn Daughtry. Love you, proud of you. And then we have a son who's a Georgetown lawyer who came to us one day and said, Dad, I'm not doing anything but plea bargaining. I got to do something to uh, prevent. And he went back into education and became, in fact, assistant principal, uh, supervisor of schools in a certain large city. And today is a trainer of, of principals and teachers. That's Herb Jr. Proud of you, love you. And then I have a daughter, Sharon, Miss Versatility. She can do just about anything. She's a professional artist, and she heads up one of our viable organizations, Downtown Brooklyn Neighborhood Alliance. Love you, proud of you. And then my eldest daughter, Leah, the, by the way, the Reverend Leah Daughtry. Dawn is the Reverend Dawn Daughtry. They are the fifth generation of ministers. I'm the fourth, by, uh, and they're the fifth. We have a grandson, Lorenzo Chambers uh, Daughtry. He is the sixth generation. Love you, proud of you. And so Leah, by the way, Leah, by the way, uh, made history. She was the CEO of the National Democratic Party uh, in, in 2008, which propelled Obama into office. And I, can you imagine how proud I was to sit there at the executive committee? Uh, you know, that's when the big wheels meet after the convention and decide on how they're going to implement and all of that. And when she was put forward, Ben Fowler, I think his name was, put forward the, the uh, resolution uh, that uh, Leah Daughtry has produced uh, with Governor Dean, one of the best democratic conventions ever held. And then finally, finally, Hillary, Hillary, Mrs. Clint came back with Ms. Wasserman, who was chairman of the party, and said, Leah, would you please do it again? Be our national uh, coordinator, our national CEO. Uh, and so in 2016, she came back to be the national CEO for the uh, Clinton campaign. So I'm proud of the family. Love y'all. Proud of y'all. All my children. Love you. Proud of Bishop Herbert Daughtry. Come on, come on, Bishop Herbert Daughtry. And this is certainly a National Action Network. You that are listening on LIB and watching us on other platforms, y'all miss it because at the end of the rally, we're going to have some birthday cake here for Bishop Daughtry. Right. He and I don't eat it, but he's going to help celebrate it. And uh, he has really been a real pillar to our community all over the world. <clears throat> and, and certainly special uh, to me in my life 
and my uh, development as an activist. And let me also say, you know, last night I talked with uh, Reverend Jackson. I talked with uh, Reverend Jackson at least once or twice a week. And even with the Parkinson's, uh, uh, they say, how do you understand them? Because sometimes it's hard to understand them in the evening. But I told him, if you ran around long as I did with James Brown, you understand anybody. Because <laughs> nobody knew what James Brown was saying but me. But I told uh, Reverend Jackson last night that today was Bishop Daughtry Day and he wanted to give him his regard. He says, uh, yeah, me and Daughtry loved you since you was a little boy. I said, I think he loved me a little longer than you. He said, well, we'll fight about that later. But I wanted to give him uh, from Reverend Jesse Jackson and Martin Luther King III and others uh, honoring on this day Bishop Herbert Daughtry. Give him another hand. <laughs> On Monday is Martin Luther King holiday, and I'll outline in a minute uh, what we'll be doing all day, but in the afternoon it is our tradition here at National Action Network that we have all the public officials come and report what they're doing in the King spirit. But one I wanted, and I'm glad he honored us to come and spend a few minutes this morning, is one who's been an outstanding example of the legacy and movement that we are in now built on the precepts of Dr. King. This is a young man that came up and shocked the world when he won a congressional district that was not a black district but he became the congressman based on his service and based on emulating what Dr. King stood for. And I asked him if he would not consider robbery if he came today so he wouldn't would just arrest the officials and give us uh, some things that he's working on and doing. He is presently the lieutenant governor of the state of New York. Let us greet our Lieutenant Governor, Antonio Delgado. Good morning, Nan. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Reverend Al Sharpton, for your leadership and for the invitation and the opportunity. Uh, happy birthday, Bishop Daughtry. Thank you for your legacy your living legacy. I'm going to be brief, but I, it always uh, means a lot to be here at NAN, and, and, and in particular, as we come into the long weekend where we honor and lift up the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., a remarkable human being and leader. Now, I, I have long been inspired as uh, Reverend Sharpton mentioned by the accomplishments in the life uh, of Dr. King. He was a giant of a man, not just in deeds, but in intellect and in spirit. He was a man who deeply committed himself to abiding by what he would call unenforceable, unenforceable obligations. As Dr. King explained in his sermon on being a good neighbor, unenforceable obligations are beyond the reach of the laws of society. They concern inner attitudes, genuine person-to-person -person relations, and expressions of compassion that law books cannot regulate and jails cannot rectify. Dr. King said that these obligations are met by one's commitment to an inner law written on the heart. Man-made laws assure justice, but a higher law produces love. Now, these are powerful words that resonate, particularly given the divisive, violent and hate-filled times we are living through today. The sort of times if he were alive today, Dr. King might refer to as midnight within the moral order. Now in his sermon, A Knock at Midnight, Dr. King tells us that midnight within the moral order is when moral principles lose their distinctiveness, when right and wrong are a matter of what the majority is doing 
and relative to likes and dislikes. According to Dr. King, midnight in the moral order is when people desperately seek to obey what he called the 11th commandment, thou shalt not get caught. <laughs> Under the ethic of midnight, the cardinal sin is to be caught and the cardinal virtue is to get by. It is all right to lie, but one must lie with real finesse. It is all right to steal if one is so dignified that if caught, the charge becomes embezzlement and not robbery. It is permissible to hate if one so dresses the hate in the garments of love that the hate appears to be love. Midnight within the moral order is that time, as Dr. King said, when survival of the fittest is substituted by a philosophy of survival of the slickest. How prophetic, how prophetic. Now as midnight of the moral order sweeps across our country, the need to build in ourselves and in our communities the capacity to abide by unenforceable obligations, the need to heed the inner law that produces love is absolutely critical. We must create the right environment for loving ourselves and loving each other to help ourselves and to help each other. Now, it will not be easy, but it is necessary. And we can find strength in our faith, in our history, and in the legacy of Dr. King. As Lieutenant Governor, this is certainly where I draw my strength from as I look to lead the newly created Office of Service and Civic Engagement just announced in the Governor's State of the State. I believe a statewide initiative anchored in service to each other and our communities is exactly the type of work that must be done in order to ensure that we strengthen our collective bond and enlarge our capacity to abide by unenforceable obligations. This means meeting folks where they are. Bishop, this means closing the gap. Meeting them in underserved communities, on college campuses, in senior centers, with volunteered and paid service opportunities that empower folks and enable a moral awakening. We are too isolated at the moment. The loneliness epidemic is real, and loneliness kills us. It is a sickness in us that hurts our hearts physically and spiritually. It makes us retreat and act badly. We know that in the absence of connection and community, an environment of incivility and hate can take root. Recommitting to service allows us to reconnect and experience our shared humanity. This in turn produces more love and an increased desire for civic engagement. And as the chair of the state's hate and bias prevention unit, I'm excited to fuse the work of this unit with the work of the Office of Service and Civic Engagement. For as we increase opportunities to serve, we also increase the capacity of folks across the state to combat hate and bias through educational outreach efforts, community gatherings, and youth initiatives. This, this is how we transform society from the inside out and do so in pursuit of justice. This is Dr. King's legacy. He knew the transformative power of love. He lived it through and through to his dying day. The world did not dictate his inner being. His inner being dictated the world. And through his inner being, the world became more just. Now, as we navigate midnight within the moral order, it is imperative that we recommit ourselves to the role each of us can play in bringing the light of love to the world. Love, as Dr. King said, is the most durable power in the world, the most potent instrument available in humankind's quest for peace and security. We must give back to not just rebuilding things, but also rebuilding people. People need to be inspired to unite, not pushed to divide. And this work must be cultivated across our state, across our country, from the ground up in a systematic fashion. We must create spaces for difficult conversations and hard truths where it is safe to be mistaken or even to acknowledge faults, even be ignorant, where mercy and grace are in abundance and where love is at the center of the work that we do. 
Will it be easy? Of course not. The work of justice and truth is never easy. But remember that justice is love in action. So the key is to find the strength to love and to find purpose in the pain born of the adversity. Now I'm going to leave you with a quote from, of course, Dr. King on adversity. And hopefully you can take this with you and stay inspired. He said, at times in our lives, the tailwinds of joy, triumph, and fulfillment favor us. And at times, the headwinds of disappointment, sorrow, and tragedy beat unrelentingly against us. Shall we permit adverse winds to overwhelm us as we journey across life's mighty Atlantic? Or will our inner spiritual engine sustain us in spite of the winds? Our refusal to be stopped, our courage to be, our determination to go on in spite of reveals the divine image within us. Reveals the divine image within us. The individual who has made this discovery knows that no burden can overwhelm him or her. And no wind of adversity can blow his or her hope away. God bless you. Lieutenant Governor Antonio Delgado, give him a big hand. Give him a big hand and we thank him for coming by and making that statement. Let, let me say uh, that as we are, are now, we're live also on Impact Television all over the world. Give our Impact family a big hand. One of the goals that we have, and I'm honored to say this in the presence of uh, Reverend Dr. Sister Karen Daughtry. Give her another hand, Reverend Daughtry. Amen. 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 One of the goals that we have, and I've said it before, and I'm going to keep saying it, is that one of our goals is we want to see uh, the D. Uh, segregation of black images and tributes in New York. What do I mean by that? I don't like the fact that we have Malcolm X Boulevard that ends at Central Park. That's right. That's right. That's right. That we have Adam Clayton Powell Boulevard that ends at Central Park. <laughs> that downtown is 7th Avenue or downtown is 8th Avenue, because the businesses downtown don't want their address to be Malcolm X Boulevard, Adam Clay. Don't give me no ghetto streets. Give me a street that runs all the way through. And one of the goals of this organization is we want to see Atlantic Avenue, Herb Daughtry Boulevard. Atlantic Avenue runs from one side of Brooklyn to the other. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And we want to see that street where so many people came to get justice, came to get deliverance, came to get help. On this street, Herb Daughtry Boulevard, movements were born. And it will not be limited to the black side of Brooklyn. We want it from one side to the other, named after Bishop Herbert Daughtry. So that's one of our goals. Now, somebody told me, well, they don't name streets till they die. They got folks that they don't name streets of still alive. And if we can't get that done with the mayor who came out of Daughtry's ministry and the city council that half of them came out, and me that's loudmouth in town, then when we going to get it done? So I wanted to say in the presence of Karen Daughtry, because, you know, Reverend Daughtry give you some slack, but Karen Daughtry point her finger at you, you start backing up. 
So, you know, for me to say in front of her, she going to make me keep this word. But do we want Herb Daughtry Boulevard? Come on, do we want that? And I'm serious about that. We cannot continue. I was talking yesterday. I was in Columbus, Ohio to speak for uh, the Teachers Association and got a call from Betty Dobson of Simotap. And we're getting ready to do some things to help her keep Dr. John Hendrick Clark house here in Harlem. <laughs> uh, we got to do what we got to do. And, uh, and, and as Bishop Daughtry said, we all sometimes come out of different veins. But it doesn't matter. One of the most memorable things that I can say to my children and grandson is that uh, when we were on 125th in Madison, and uh, there was an occasion that night, and uh, Kwame Toure, formerly known as Stokely Carmichael, came up in the House of Justice. And we sat in my office. And he said, you know, Sharpton, I know you came out of the king side and you were not necessarily with us, the black power side. He said, but I, he said, I really loved Dr. King. And I said, you did? He said, yeah, I know we were rough on him because back in the Freedom Riders days, they used to call Dr. King the Lord. Here come the Lord coming. He going to take all the publicity. We doing the work. So all this tension and stuff. Uh, is not new. There was always fights. Du Bois and Garvey fought. There was always fight. Y'all ain't the first Negroes to fight. <laughs> but they would always come together for a joint cause. And he said that I remember when James Meredith, this is uh, Stokely Carmichael talking to me, Kwame Toure talking to me. He said, I remember when James Meredith was shot leading a march against fear in Mississippi. James Meredith, who was the first one black to go to the school, the Ole Miss school. And they shot him because he wanted to lead this march against fear. And the guy wanted to show you got something to be afraid of and shot him. He said, and all of the civil rights groups, Dr. King, NAACP, all of us said, we got to continue to march. And he said, we came into Mississippi. And Cleveland Sellers, who was with him in SNCC, and I said, this would be a great time to popularize the slogan, Black Power, because the media is going to be here. And he said, we waited till the media got there, and Dr. King and them started marching, and we started yelling, Black Power. And the media flipped to us, and this slogan got out there. He said, at the end of the evening, Al, I said to Dr. King, he said, well, I, I, I hope you ain't too mad we used you. And he said, Dr. King looked at me and patted me on the back and said, I've been used before, Stokely. Don't worry about it. And he said, and he marched with us all three days and said that I have a different way, but we all trying to struggle. And Dr. King had a thing called saying that it's not the thesis or the antithesis, but it's the synthesis that make us strong. And he said, when Dr. King got killed, Al, I went to his funeral. And I cried worse than his family. Because I realized he loved us enough to disagree and stand with us anyhow. That's the kind of man Dr. King was. And that's the kind of leadership that Bishop Daughtry has shown. Like he said, known me since I was 11, 12 years old. And all of us would get in the fights. He'd be the ones that convened. Some of us would be not speak to each other. Some of us still ain't speaking to each other. I'm mad at some of them now. I don't even remember why I'm mad, but I know I'm not speaking to them. But he kind of got us all together. And that's why as, as time goes on, I want children unborn to ride down Daughtry Boulevard in Brooklyn, New York. On Monday, we start in Washington, as we do every year, at our annual Martin Luther King breakfast. Uh, the governor of Maryland, uh, who is the only sitting black governor in the country, Wes Moore, has been honored. He will speak 
Martin Luther King III now convening that, and uh, Felicia Rashad, the actress, will be among the others. And then we fly back to New York. 1.30 will be our Martin Luther King public policy forum here, and all of the elected officials come every year and speak from Schumer to the mayor on what they're doing in light of Dr. King. And then at 6, we're at Mount Pisgah in Jersey City with uh, Reverend, our uh, Northeast Regional Director, Reverend Steffi Bartley. One of the things that uh, uh, concerns me is always is America, Bishop Mason, uh, has a way of kidnapping holidays. America has a way of commercializing and distorting holidays. I never did find out how Santa Claus got in the way of Jesus. I never did find out how an Easter bunny kidnapped the resurrection. And we go for this. We have children sitting on Santa's lap that don't never ever hear the story of the baby in the manger. We got you saving money to buy a new Easter outfit and you have not resurrected from anything. Most of us wear a cross and never bear a cross. Diamond studded crosses. And if we're not careful, they will over time change the Martin Luther King holiday that they never intended to have to be a distortion of what Dr. King was about. I, I, I told Martin the third, and, and y'all see him here all the time and we work close together. I said, one of the things, Martin, that concerns me is when I was growing up, they used to have uh, President George Washington, Washington birthday, and then Lincoln birthday. And now they have just President's Day. Gwen uh, knows she and I grew up around the same time when Hardy was taking us to school. And <laughs> now they have combined Lincoln and Washington to one day, President's Day. If you're not careful, they will link January 15th, King Day, to February 14th, Valentine's Day, call it Love Day. And unless we keep people in power, they will not have any resistance to doing that. Martin Luther King is not just in history because he was a poet of love. He was a freedom fighter and an activist that changed the social order of this country. Let's be clear. Martin Luther King's home was bombed three times in Montgomery. They don't talk about that. They indicted him for stealing the money of the movement. You read all the bios of Martin Luther King, they don't talk about that. I was reading Google the other day, they leave that out. They indicted him saying he stole the money from the Montgomery movement and had to be acquitted in state of Alabama court as a thief. So the first thing they're gonna do when you become an activist leader is try to discredit you. Yeah. Ain't no accident that Dr. King, Adam Clayton Powell, Marcus Garvey, all of them face income tax indictments. Cause they want to make people feel they're crooks and they're doing it for personal profit. So with all of them being prosecuted for the same thing, that either means that all black leaders are crooks or there's something about the system that uses the same playbook on all of us. I remember about 25, 30 years ago, they got on Local 5 and lied on Reverend Daughtry. He was one of the few that successfully sued them. You thought I forgot that. I tell you, I've been following Daughtry all my life. He, he took them to task. 
and sued them because they will always mischaracterize those that stand up for you. And the sad part is half of the black folk will believe it. I know they were doing something. Other day, a guy writing on how does the mayor pay for his suits? What he's supposed to wear? But the racial implication is you must be doing something wrong. That's why they write stories now about me having nice suits on TV. The same folk used to talk about me in track suits. So I don't care what you say, I'm going to wear what I like to wear. Because if they can get you into the minor stuff, they get your mind off the major stuff. That's why the danger of just being in social media all day is you get caught up more with gossip or bossip than you get caught up on substance. And you miss that they're taking your right to vote. And you miss that they're ending DEI. And you miss that they're dealing with educational inequality. Right now, they are trying to stop DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. The last two weeks, we've marched on one of the leaders of the Kill DEI, Bill Ackman. And we go on Thursday. Brother McHenry has led that. Thursday with, with uh, I was in Ohio, I'll be with y'all Thursday, 12 noon, 54th and 11th, because DEI is an outgrowth of policies started by Martin Luther King. And what I'm, I'm going to deal with DEI and what the public officials need to do about DEI, I'm going to deal with it while they're here on Monday. We should not have any major corporation in this state that says that they are going to end DEI and be able to do that without our doing what we're doing to Ackman. Well, what do you mean, Reverend Al? Dr. King said that he lived to the day. The distortions of Dr. King said he lived to the day where his children would not be judged by the color of their skin but the content of their character. He did not say that to mean color didn't matter. He said that to say that they would not be misjudged by their color. But if you're going to quote that line, quote the whole speech. He also said that America had given blacks a check that had bounced in the bank of justice. Which means that if we are to get the right payment on our check, that is DEI, affirmative action, and reparation. Yes, sir. Dr. King's last struggle was around economic rights and economic inequality, where he wanted to bring poor people to Washington. Resurrection City and deal with the inequality. You cannot close down DEI and affirmative action and ignore reparations and honor Martin Luther King. Right. He said it's not enough that we can now go in any hotel if we can't afford the room. Not enough. We can send our kids now to any college because of our movement, but they can't pay the tuition. Economic rights. He also mentioned in the I Have a Dream speech, and this organization sponsored the anniversaries. That we did the 40th, the 50th, and did last year the 60th anniversary. 30 years. We've been the, the ones that were sponsored with Martin III going to Washington. And 
That's why I know and read and reread that speech. He talked about police brutality in that speech. When we've dealt with police brutality from Amadou Diallo, I've been dealing with it since Claude Reese, since I was a kid. Daughtry before that. He marched in Graves Inn before we went to Howard Beach and before we went to Bensonhurst. Fact of the matter is, when, when they killed uh, Michael Griffith in Howard Beach, and I, uh, one of the young men in my youth movement at the time, Sunshine, called me, he was close with Michael Griffith, said they killed my friend. I went to Pacific Street to Miss Griffith's house and said, this is a disgrace. I come outside, all the press was there. They said, well, Reverend, what you gonna do? I said, we going to Howard Beach. Well, we don't have a motorcade. I want 50 or 100 cars to ride with us through Howard Beach. And I went on back upstairs and Jim Bell, who was a big labor leader at the time, called me and said, Reverend, I like what you're doing. Can we help you with the motorcade? I said, yeah, and I need you to do me a favor. He said, what that? I said, I want to ride with you because I don't even have a car. <laughs> I was going to have to ride the train to Howard Beach. Uh, and we got in Jim Bell's car and the, all these cars didn't meet us. And we rode out to Howard Beach. And when we pulled up across the street, across Cross Bay Boulevard, a car pulled up behind us, Reverend Herbert Daughtry. And he said, I couldn't let you come out here by yourself. That's 1986. That's the kind of real leaders lead from the front, from the middle, or behind. Don't matter. As long as they keep it moving. He said, I don't want you out here by yourself. Go ahead, son. And went out there, and most of the leaders were what Sharpton doing. He said, whatever he's doing, we need the noise. And I think that if you're going to celebrate Dr. King, celebrate what Dr. King stood for. Celebrate fighting for economic equality. Celebrate fighting against police brutality. Celebrate fighting for what he stood for. Because we're at a time now that everything King stood for, they're trying to erode. What is King in history for? 64 Voting Rights, 64 Civil Rights Act, 65 Voting Rights Act. We at a time that they've taken out Section 2 of Voting Rights Act. We at a time that the Supreme Court has ended affirmative action. We had a time where they just ran the first black to be president of Harvard out of her job and say we're going to use that against DEI. How dare you talk about we close for Martin Luther King Day when you're trying to close down Martin Luther King's legacy. Day should not be a day to go to the mall. King Day sales. It ought to be a day about freedom fighting. It ought to be a day about standing up for the legislation that Dr. King made them write. Don't steal Dr. King's day from Dr. King's way. I look at Brother Gardner out here that's heading up what we're doing in the economic area, pointed by the mayor. I look sitting next to him, Corey Weiss, who, the, who Donald Trump said should be executed, Central Park Five. And you sitting up here talking about you got a three-day holiday. No, you got a day that you need to be fighting. So we don't have no more Curry Weisses. And fighting against the one that tried to execute that one. And we back people like Gardner and the mayor and others that are fighting to give us a foothold. 
Reverend Daughtry said all he wanted for his birthday was to leave the mayor alone. He was one that preached to us that we need to be in the police department. And Eric joined the police department under his tutelage. Now he went on, and some folk in the movement, we don't believe talking to the pigs. Two of y'all here this morning. I won't call you out. Y'all don't got to. But y'all, y'all know I know y'all in the back. And Daughtry would kind of navigate between those that were anti-police and that he had put in the police department. That's what a movement's all about. Movements are not cults where everybody bleed the same thing. Movements is no matter where you approach the movement from, if you about the objectives, then use your gifts and talents to make something happen. I tell you, I joined the movement from Washington Temple. I didn't join the movement from being involved in a nationalist movement. I came out of the Holy Roller Church. We weren't speaking in Swahili. We were speaking in tongues. But it all comes together if we all will stand for what's right. The other distortion of Dr. King is the theological distortion. Dr. King was a product of the black church. His daddy was one of the major ministers in the National Baptist Convention. His father-in-law was one of the presiding elders in the South, married his daughter. I knew his sister well who just passed in the last year. And the sister told me, he said, Reverend Al, you must understand that when we were growing up, Martin and I, his sister, she said it was segregation. She said, you from the North, your mama might have told you about segregation, but you don't understand this part. I said, what's that? She said, when big people that were black, famous blacks, would come to Atlanta to speak or to perform, they stayed at our house because they couldn't stay at a hotel down south. And the black church gave us a parsonage for our daddy. So we had the biggest house in the black community. So in the morning, we'd be coming downstairs for breakfast. James Weldon Johnson might be at the table. We grew up with giants around us. So black excellence was normalized to us. Martin expected to be somebody if you grew up with that kind of talent in your living room. And I never forgot that. That is why you must have for your children an environment that will inspire them. I see a sister in the back row, a little baby. Let these babies grow up in the house of justice. She holding it up right now. Let them grow up. I don't care if they cry. If I can't out preach a crying baby, I shouldn't be up here. My mother was wise enough after my father left to keep bringing me to Washington Temple. And I kept preaching. And Bishop Washington in them days Two blocks on President Street, most of the major preachers live. Gardner Taylor was on the corner. Sandy Ray was in the middle of the block. T.J. Boyd across the street. Bishop Washington on this side of the street. Bill Jones across this side. So I would go after school and play with Bishop Washington's daughter, Frederick and Ernest. And then we'd play with Gardner Taylor's daughter. I had no idea how big them preachers were. But I grew up in an environment of looking at people that were great as normal. So I expected to be somebody. I didn't come from that pedigree or background, but I came with a psyche of being somebody. 
And if you raise your child not to where they at, but where they need to go, your child will go there. Bishop Dutch said he comes from five generations of preachers. I come from five generations of folk I can't talk about in the air. <laughs> but I got around folk like Dutch. And I was able to absorb the same training. That's why y'all should bring your children young in the movements. Because they won't know nothing else and they will have a sense of somebody. When Jesse came talking about I am somebody, I took that seriously. I told Khalid one night, maybe you didn't need that. But I grew up with my father left and there was no man in my house. I needed a man to tell me I was somebody. I needed a man to tell me I was God's child. That was the king theology. But now we reduced our pulpits to where Im we're imitating others with this, let's smile. Don't you feel better? This is a glory. What kind of theology is that? And we eating it up. Children of Israel didn't smile their way out of bondage. God sent seven plagues. Yeah. Then they had to march up to the Red Sea. You don't positive think your way out of bondage. You positive think your way into a struggle. Knowing that if you fight, yeah. that God will use your positive energy to help liberate you. Yeah. 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 Bible talks about the church is the salt of the earth. Well, you can't be the salt of the earth, Reverend, with a sugar-coated gospel. You can't mix sugar with salt. Both of them is white. Both of them particles. But you're supposed to be salt. When they're killing affirmative action, when they're stopping voting rights, when they got outright bigots running for president, where's the salt of the earth? You got two leading Republican candidates. Trump, who said this week that Lincoln should have negotiated the Civil War. How are you going to negotiate slavery? Either you're going to end slavery or not. But say negotiate, well, what? He's going to keep some slaves and not let. What does that mean? Nikki Haley, they asked her what was the Civil War about. Oh, oh, about good government and all that. White guy and I would say, I'm shocked you didn't say something about slavery. What do you want me to say? These are two leading candidates that are redoing and rewriting and differently projecting what slavery was. And you sitting around talking about how old Biden is. He two years older than he was when you voted for him. How y'all shocked he's 80 when you voted for him at 78? You didn't think he was going to make it? I'd rather have an old man on my side than an old indicted crook that's talking about they should have negotiated my great-grandfather being a slave. But you're afraid to stand up. And King's theology was to stand up against unrighteousness, was to stand up against the wicked, was to stand up against those that persecuted God's children. If you want to celebrate King, celebrate the whole King. That talked about, I, I heard Bishop Mason talking about love and justice. One of the books Dr. King loved to read, I got from Jesse, was Paul Tillich, Love, Power, and Justice. You got to have the balance, Stephen Marshall. 
Bishop Marshall, Bishop Mason, make Marshall read that book. He, he, he run around behind you and I learning how to holler, but make him read a little bit too. <laughs> Love, Power, and Justice. I read it when I was 12 years old, following around behind Jesse. I understood it when I was about 21, but I could quote it. You know, when you're a boy preacher, you quote more than you can understand. Sometimes life will make you understand what you've been saying. You know, we get them church say a lot of stuff. Lord will make a way somehow. That was cute when I was seven. But when I got about 17 and start going through trouble, I said, oh, that's what this means. You know, it was cute when I was five, six, seven-year-old boy preaching. And I'm talking about God will bring you through trials and tribulations. That was cute. Ain't no five-year-old boy had no tribulations. <laughs> but I can tell you now, he'll bring you food. Yeah. Trials and tribulations. Yeah. Not because I heard the old preacher say it, because I've been through the trials. Yeah. I've been through the tribulation. Yeah. I've been through the ups and the downs. Yeah. I've been through nights I thought I'd never get through, but somehow... Some way God made a way out of no way. That's why on his birthday, Herbert Herb Daughtry can say that I thank him. Because he know the years that he thought he'd never see this long. He know the years they counted him out, but God counted him back in. The years they ignored him, but now he can't be ignored. There is a God yeah. that'll walk with you, yeah. that'll talk with you. Yeah. That's why on Monday, children are going to sit home because they closed the government down. Yeah. I told Martin the third this one night. We were flying into a certain city. And you know how the planes circle before they land, yeah. waiting to get told that landing is safe. And as we were circling this city, I, we were sitting together, Martin and I, and I said, Martin, you know something? He said, what's that? I said, y your father won. He said, what do you mean, Al? I mean, we, we weren't even talking about his father. I said, no, I thought about it. I said, you remember your mother used to show us them pictures? of them dragging your father up the courthouse steps in Montgomery indicted for income tax? He said, yeah. I said, you remember the picture that Y.T. Walker took in a Birmingham jail of your father doing time for marching in Birmingham and why it took the picture of him looking out the jail cells? He said, yeah. I said, and you remember how they used to have raised money for the movement and they would rush to put the money in the bank so they could make payroll? He said, yeah. I said, well, do you realize the courthouse that they dragged your father up in Montgomery would be closed the third Monday in every year to celebrate his birthday? Judge can't come to work. Bailiff can't come to work. Do you realize the banks we used to have to rush to, all of them will be closed. Third in, in January. Mm -hmm. The places that they would keep your father out of now are closed to honor his birthday. That's why I believe the scripture, if you're faithful over a few things, he'll make you ruler over many things. And then if you get to the end of the book, the one thing God promised us, don't care where you are now. Don't worry about your status now. He promised at the end of Revelations that the first would be last. And the last would be first. And the lion and the lamb going to lay down together. And God would make a way out of no way. On King Day, I'm going to fight for the last. Because God promised if we stand up, he'd hold us up. He promised if we open up a mouth, he'd speak for us. He promised if we'd make one step, he'd make two. 
Happy King Day. Stand up for what's righteous. Happy King Day. Stand up for what's truthful. Happy King Day. Stand up for the bloodstained banner. God will. God will. God will. Make a way. Yes, he will. Yes, he will. April 3rd, Martin Luther King made his last speech. Mason Temple Church of God in Christ. The next night he was scheduled to go to Reverend Samuel Kyle's home for dinner. He came outside his room, room 306 in the Lorraine Motel in Memphis, Tennessee. He looked down the courtyard and Ben Branch, who led the Breadbasket Orchestra at that time. And Jesse Jackson was there, and he invited him to dinner, and he said to Ben, he said, Ben, I want you to sing my song tonight. I want you to play my song tonight. Play it real pretty for me. Precious Lord, take my hand. Lead me on. Let me stand. But sometimes I get tired, I get weak, and I'm worn. But through the storms, through the night, hold my hand to the light. That was the last request Dr. King asked. And a minute later, a bullet went through his skull. He never did hear that song that night, but ever since that day, we sang that song, thinking about Dr. King. How they robbed him of hearing that, but the Lord he was wanted to hear singing about is still making us through the night. Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, let me stand. Precious Lord, take my hand. Lead me on, let me stay. I, I am tired, I am weak. Oh, Lord. oh. Through the night.
Everybody's singing. Everybody's singing. Everybody's singing. Everybody's singing. Sing it like you mean it. Sing it like you mean it. Everybody's singing. Everybody's singing. Everybody's singing. One more time, y'all. One more time, y'all. One more time, y'all. I'm open the doors of the movement. There may be someone here today that never joined National Action Network. You hear us on the radio. You see some of our activities on television, but never became a member of the organization. If you're here today and want to join, there's no better Saturday than to join on MLK Holiday Saturday. Just come down to me and let us sign you up right now. Come on. Everybody's singing. Come on. Everybody's singing. Everybody's singing. Everybody's singing. Everybody's singing. Everybody's singing. We want justice, we want freedom, we want justice, one more time y'all, one more time y'all, one more time y'all. going to sign up our new members. We got one more coming. Come on. Everybody sing. Come on. Everybody sing. Everybody sing. Everybody sing. Everybody now. Everybody sing. Everybody sing it. All right. Got a bunch of new members on MLK Weekend. Ain't that wonderful? And I can't help but be so proud. 
Uh, you don't know how much Tyrone Richardson and I labored and worked to teach Tisha Hunter how to sing like that. <laughs> we just feel proud every time she said. All the nights we stayed up with her getting her ready. Now, can she say, give her a big hand. We ain't got nothing to do with it. We ain't got nothing to do with it. All right. She was sick last week. We missed her, but she here today. They, they coming back told me, Tisha is sick. She won't be here today. I said, well, Chris and I can do a duet. Tyrone Richard said, that'll be all right. I got it. I got it. <laughs> all right. Let's raise our offering. Then we're going to bring out the cake for Bishop Herbert Daughtry. And we're going to have some Daughtry cake in the house. <laughs> 